Good morning, everybody. Um, as Colin said, my name is Fiona Hannan, and I'm the Supply Regulation Manager at Airtricity. So you might wonder why Airtricity would be presenting at a conference on public services, but I suppose um, my background is that I came to Airtricity from the Commission for Energy Regulation, where I was responsible, as Conan said, for working with the NDA and the Centre for Universal Design to develop um, the world's first standard in universal design. So just to give you a bit of background on Airtricity, um, we're the largest independent supplier of natural gas and electricity on the island of Ireland, um, with customers in both the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. And since 2008, we've grown from having 35,000 customers to over 800,000 customers, so a significant increase in the number of customers that we are servicing on a, on a daily basis. Um, we supply gas, electricity, home energy services, which is providing services like gas boiler servicing, changing your boiler out. So we're visiting customers in their homes as well as dealing with them on a daily basis over the phone and over the internet. Okay, no worries. Um, in terms of the obligations on electricity and gas suppliers, um, in 2011, um, legislation was passed in Ireland which placed an obligation on suppliers um, to consider the principles of universal design when designing all services, products and communications for their customers. And I suppose this was, a, I suppose, a new thing for suppliers, particularly people who um, weren't state bodies. So, for example, Electric Ireland or Burgos would traditionally have had um, accessibility and disability requirements, but this is now rolling it out to all suppliers in the industry. Um, and the industry is regulated by the Commission for Energy Regulation, so that obligation then was translated into suppliers' licences. In terms of what universal design means, um, this is the official defini definition in our standards, so people may be familiar with this, and I apologise, so I'm going to try and read it out, um, but it's quite a long definition. It means the design and composition of an environment so that it may be accessed, understood, and used to the greatest practical extent in the most independent and natural manner possible, in the widest possible range of situations, and by persons of any age or size or having any particular physical, sensory, mental health or intellectual ability or disability. And it means in relation to electronic systems, any electronics-based process of creating products, services or systems so that they can be used by any person. So as you can see, an extremely long and difficult to even read out loud definition of what universal design is. Um, from my perspective, universal design is around applying common sense to the design of your products. And it's a lot about what um, Ben and Joshua were talking about, and it's building for inclusion. It's making sure at the start of your project, you're considering the entire life cycle of your customer. You're not just considering somebody with 20-20 vision, perfect hearing and perfect health. Because in reality, you know, there's, there's a, way, a range of needs and a range of abilities and a range of customers that we are dealing with on a daily basis. And you can't just pick, you know, one particular area and concentrate on that. You need to consider the, the needs of all of your customers when you're dealing with these things. In terms of how we've gone about implementing universal design in the industry, um, we decided in order to give suppliers guidance on how you would go about doing this, because for a lot of people, this was the first time they'd considered the concept of designing in this way. We developed what's known as a SWIFT standard. It's a fast track voluntary standard that the NSAI um, uh, can develop and publish. So it was the development of that standard was co-chaired by myself on behalf of the Commission for Energy Regulation and James Hubbard on behalf of the NDA and the Centre for Universal Design. Um, but that um, the, the development of that standard was done by a group of people um, who fully represented our customer base. Um, all suppliers were represented. Deaf here were involved, the National Council for the Blind in Ireland, the National Adult Literacy Agency, and a number of other experts in the area of accessibility and universal design. Um, the development of the standard was done on a consensus-based approach in that everything was discussed, everybody understood what it was we were committing to in developing the standard, and it was also developed with uh, the concept of it had to be practical for business to implement. 
in terms of the standard and the content of the standard, it was based on the key areas of suppliers' business, drawing on the existing guidelines and best practices that existed for um, accessibility and universal design. And the key areas covered were written communication, verbal communication, and digital and web-based services. And that standard was launched in February 2012. So I suppose when you look at universal design, um, I suppose I'm not an expert in the area of accessibility myself, but in terms of why would you implement universal design? Well, the first thing I would say is in considering the needs and ranges of all of your customers, you're building trust with your customer because you're trying to have them be included and participate in every activity that they need to be involved in as your customer. You're also future-proofing your products and services. Um, I think it was alluded to earlier that a lot of people acquire a disability through the course of their life. Not everybody is born with a disability. And what you're doing by designing from scratch a service that meets the needs of the life cycle of your customer, that person then doesn't need to go out and get something special in order to interact with you. You've designed from scratch. Um, I had a look at the, the latest census data, um, and it's showing that at, at, at the 2011 um, census, over 750,000 750, people are aged over 60 in our state. And I suppose traditionally you would associate a deterioration in eyesight and hearing, particularly with people who are, are getting older. Not everybody, obviously, but some people experience these things. Also under the census, almost 600,000 people class themselves as having a level of disability. Um, so that would be about 13% of the population. In terms of improving service and how Airtricity has approached trying to reach our customers in these situations, we've taken a stepped approach to implementation and we've had targeted first steps. By no means have we reached award-winning status. Um, obviously, long-term, we would love to be in that situation, and it's, it's, it's difficult to follow such a fantastic example of building for inclusion as the one presented by Joshua and Ben. But the first thing we have done is looked at what can we do easily, and there's a lot of things you can do easily within your business to try and improve um, the, the accessibility of your services to customers. So the first thing we have done is we looked at all our literature and co looked at converting everything to plain English. Um, so that was our first step. The other thing we have done is, as a, as a supplier of energy, we, we are reliant. And I'm sure a number of people in the room here today are working with um, large IT systems that are unwieldy and can take years to change um, and are extremely costly to change. So we weren't in a position to scratch our billing and IT systems, but what we have done is we've built in a requirement into all IT-based projects that universal design is a consideration and any changes being made. So as we're evolving that system and as we're changing that system, it's built in from the first level of consideration. What are the impacts on universal design and what aspects of universal design can we draw into these changes? Um, in terms of specific changes that we have made, and I have to say personally, working on developing the standard was a real eye-opener in terms of simple things that potentially you might not consider, but can have a huge impact on your customers. And I think it's around the concept again of small steps and small changes can lead to a big improvement for your customer. So one of the things that we have looked quite closely at in the last while is our IVR phone system. And I'm sure everybody's familiar with ringing a service provider and pressing one for something and pressing two and then being asked to speak into the phone and the phone doesn't recognize your voice and you know you get your digit wrong on your account number. So one of the things, and it had always been um, an issue for our customers, and we would have received a high level of negative feedback in relation to the IVR, IVR system. So one of the first things we've done and over the last 18 months is we've reviewed our IVR phone system, streamlining the choice selection for customers and narrowing it down to the minimum. So it means that a customer now gets to, uh, to speak to a person a lot more quickly than they would have done in the past. Instead of sending them around circles and pressing buttons, you know, you've a s simple streamlined choice and then you get through to an agent. So that has reduced the time to re reach an agent by 60% for customers. So it is a considerable drop. Um, and we have seen a considerable drop in customer complaints regarding the service, and we've seen a considerable increase in positive feedback in relation to customer service there. Um, we've also looked at our website to ensure that it's designed to the WCAG 2.0 standard, which is an accessibility standard. 
um, and, and that is to make sure that I suppose our, our website interacts with um, readers for customers with vision impairments. But it's not just um, about building the architect architecture of the website, it's also looking at the content of the website again as what the guys were talking about earlier. And what we've done is we've tried to look at the content, particularly in relation to our sign up process. There's a lot of information we have to give customers when they're signing up to us around terms and conditions, um, what they're si signing up to, things about guarantees. And it's like trying to streamline the content of that. So it's in plain English, pres presented in a as easy to understand way as possible um, with as little, I suppose, extra material as, as possible. So we've looked at overhauling that. We've just gone live in Northern Ireland with our new sign-up process, and we're looking to roll that out in Republic of Ireland. Um, the other thing we're looking at, and I suppose this is my new catchphrase in the business, our small print is getting bigger. You know, one of the, the, the key things that people complain about is, you know, terms and conditions are always in tiny print on things. And one of the things we're looking to start a trial, it's in print at the moment, I had hoped to have a copy of it today, but um, and we're trialling in Northern Ireland that our sales brochure would be enlarged to an A4 size with larger print for customers so that they're not receiving something that in reality you know, a lot of people can't read the small print, physically can't read it, let alone, you know, leaving literacy issues aside, it's not big enough for people to read and understand what they're signing up to. So we're trialling the large print brochure. They're hopefully going to go live next week. Um, we've reviewed all our system-generated letters as part of our IT development um, to increase font sizes and plain English them. Um, our e-bills, again, can be Zoomed, and we have a lot of people interacting online with us. Um, we've focused on improving our digital services and allowing customers to fully manage their accounts online and through email and I appreciated that, that not all customers can interact online um, but we do have a focus on trying to develop those web based services um, you can now review and pay your bills online, submit your meter readings open close or move your account online um, and we have seen a lot of positive feedback in relation to those services in terms of the business and Airtricity moving forward with the universal design, um, we're embedding universal design into our everyday business. Um, I think it's important that everybody in the business is aware of universal design, and I think Donal is going to talk about the, the toolkits on universal design that have been developed by the, the, the centre. But um, they recently launched the toolkits tool for the energy industry. They're now being embedded into all of our employees' training. Um, we're looking at the company brand guidelines at the moment to embed and incorporate all UD requirements into those brand guidelines so that it's not a choice within the business, it's a standard practice within the business, how we interact with our customers and how we, we I suppose, go forth and deal with them. Universal design is going to be our standard practice um, and we're looking to complete the full implementation and move to universal design in our services. Um, that's pretty much my uh, presentation. One of the things I would say in relation to universal design, and one of the things I suppose as a business, and I'm sure as a public service you're all hearing, is in relation to costs and cutting costs and what is the impact cost-wise of changes and moves and, and improvements in services. One of the big advantages in universal design is that by designing universally in the first instance, you are saving costs in the long run because you have built in, and it's a lot cheaper to design from the starting point, including these services, than trying to retrospectively improve or fix a service. Um, and, and this is a message that we're constantly pushing out within our own business, because sometimes people can be resistant to change. But I think it's a message that people can take away in terms of going back into the various departments. You design up front to include these services, and in the long run, you will save costs. Um, and you have to instill it in the culture and people have to be aware of what it is. Um, I think that's pretty much it uh, from me. So thank you very much.